What a pleasure to be with all of you tonight, and a pleasure to be with you. I've enjoyed the conversation backstage. Uh, so here is your latest book, In Sunlight and in Shadow. Uh, may, may I seize the wheel from you for a second? Go ahead. Why not? Yeah. Just for a second, and then you can go back to that. All right. I just want to say, because I don't think the opportunity would arise, that uh, I, I mean, it sounds like uh, uh, that I've forgotten his name, John Malkovich in, in the movie where he goes to a town and he says, I love this town, I love this, but I do love Chicago, I always have. I, I, I try to get my wife to move here, but she won't because she's from here. <laughs> and she says the weather is bad, but I've never experienced that, but maybe just luck. Uh, and I wanted to tell you just one thing about Chicago, and that is this. 20 years ago, uh, I had, I, I sometimes work at the Wall Street Journal, and I was doing it more then. I was younger, and I had lunch with the Mexican ambassador, the ambassador, ambassador of Mexico to the United States, not to the United Nations. And it was in the private dining room at the Wall Street Journal, which has since blown out by the World Trade Center collapse. But they had the, by the way, they had the first ticker tape machine there as the only decoration. And during the lunch, he explained to us that part of his responsibility was to look after Mexican citizens in the United States, which of course makes sense. And as part of his uh, description of that, he said, do you realize that in Chicago, there are eight million Mexicans? And everyone sort of, you could hear a pin drop. And we said, eight million? And he said, yes, eight, eight million. And we all looked at each other, and I said, his English was perfect, but I said, ocho million? <laughs> and he said, si, ocho million. So uh, you didn't know that. <laughs> but every time I, I think of Chicago, I think of the eight million Mexicans who live here. <laughs> it's more crowded than it looks. <laughs> well, I, my, my, the solution to that problem was that they look Polish. <laughs> So, what, what is, it's going to be the easiest interview of my life, you should just keep going. Oh, yeah, well, I have to also mention <laughs> that, you know, when, when you go out and you do these things, the publisher these days, because publishing is in such desperate straits, says, you, you, you should have a media coach. I, I say to them, look, I've been doing this for 40 years, and, uh, and I don't need a media coach. And they say, but, you know, but we'll get you a media coach. So they got me one, it's Fidel Castro. So I may, my answers may be long. Fil <laughs> filibusters. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for the filibusters. Okay. What is this book about? And uh, we're going to get back to all of these other things. Okay. Now, may I be long? <laughs> right. Why stop now? Okay, got it. <laughs> I have to begin uh, about 30 years ago uh, in Cleveland. Cleveland used to be a really great book town. You go to Cleveland. You get an interview with the Plain Dealer, which has previously run a review. Uh, then you go to the uh, various public radio stations, and you, there are book events, store events, etc. It was a wonderful book town back then. I don't know what it is now. I think it's not. But anyway, uh, in the early 80s, I was in Cleveland uh, on, a, on a book tour, and publishers are always late in discovering things. They, they discovered computers in about the late 90s. Uh, that even word processing. Um, they, they discovered radio in about 1975. <laughs> and they discovered television in the early 80s. So I had been doing things never on television. I had been on television before, but in another capacity. And so they sent me to Cleveland, and I was scheduled to go on, I don't remember what it was called, but it was the equivalent of Good Morning Cleveland. And everyone said to me, uh, oh, you're going to love it because you're going to be with Dorothy Fulltime. And I said, who's Dorothy Fulltime? They said, you don't know Dorothy Fulltime? Dorothy Fulltime is magnificent. She's wonderful. She's really great. And I kept on hearing about Dorothy Fulltime. I showed up at the studio early in the morning, and they, they slabbed makeup on me. And she was giving the weather or something. And then in a, in a space for a commercial, they slid me in, sat me down. And she then turned to me and said, I, I have here in the studio, whatever, whatever. And she, then she immediately said, what is your book about? Which is what you said. Mm -hmm. And the book was a collection of short stories called Ellis Island. 
It's very hard to say what a book is about, even a novel, because it's supposed to be about a really lot of things. So I looked at her and I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, she, and then she said, well, what do you mean you don't know? I said, I don't know what it's about. She said, are you so-and-so? Did, did you write this book? <laughs> and I said, I did. And she said, well, how come you don't know what your book is about? I said, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and then she said, look. She said, look, if you come on this program flogging your book, you should be able to tell me what it's about. And I said, looked at her and I said, I'm not flogging my book. And she said, well, what are you here for? And I said, I'm here because you invited me and just looked at her. And then she turned to me, and this is on air. She said, young man, you are the most difficult, unpleasant person I have ever interviewed in my life. <laughs> you, you got that? <laughs> yeah. and, and then it was cut, and they threw me off the set. Right? Yeah. I don't imagine that the publisher was happy, but television signals didn't flow from Cleveland to New York, so they didn't know. But as, here's the story. As I was leaving, the guy who was kicking me out said, uh, he was shaking because she was the doyen of, of Cleveland journalism, print, radio, TV, everything. She was a major figure. And he said, this never happened before. This is just incredible. And I, I said, well, what is it? Why is Dorothy Fuldheim so, so, such a big, he said, don't you know? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, as a young woman, a Jewish woman in the 30s, she managed to get an exclusive interview with Adolf Hitler. And then it echoed through my mind, young man, you're the most unpleasant, difficult person <laughs> that I've ever interviewed. And so, so wait, uh, why did she get an interview with Adolf Hitler? Why? Because she got off the plane at Tempelhof and it was, you know, it was a propeller plane with one of those big wooden propellers. And the propeller was going so fast you couldn't see it. She walked right into it. And it threw her across the field. Now, when I was once waiting to, 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 in a line of uh, people getting into a plane who were going to jump out of a plane. And the guy, a couple of people back from me, was a German of German origin. And there was a parachutist who was coming down in the exercise. And he was headed toward the runway, and there was a plane coming down the runway like this. And, the, the, uh, and we, all, we, we froze because it, the, it was a convergence of the twain. But then the plane went upside down, just like that movie that's out now with, with Denzel Washington. It literally, I saw this, it went upside down, and it curved over, and, and, the, and, the, and the paratrooper was OK. But the German screamed out when this was about to happen, Hochfleisch, which means mincemeat. And, <laughs> Everyone thought that Dorothy Fulltheim was going to be mincemeat, but she was untouched. And therefore, it was the talk of Berlin. Hitler saw this, or, or was told it, and he said, Jewish or not, I've got to talk to this woman. And that's how she got her interview. Yeah. So, uh, but since then, since then, uh, not since Hitler, but since Dorothy Fulltheim threw me off the set, I, uh, I've been prepared for that question. And, uh, and I, I didn't set him up for this. I swear. It's true. No, yeah, we barely yeah. talk. Okay. Um, because I realize that it's a legitimate question. And, and, uh, but, so I can't answer it straight. It's a very, I, long, it's, it's yeah. a very long printed answer, then. Yeah. It's, can I read it? Please. Okay. I got to. Oh, but I appear to have lost my. No, it's in my pocket. Minor for distance. All right. I'll, I'll read what it's, what it's about. The book is about, and this is the best answer I can give you, even though it's somewhat long-winded, but then again, Fidel will be very happy. Uh, it's about New York in the 40s, which was a world unto itself. I tried to memorize this list, but I couldn't. Uh, it's about the rise of its immigrants and the adaptation and predominant generosity of its Episcopalian aristocracy in welcoming them. It's about the surf-like sound of the streets, the golden age of the American musical theater, the great houses and families of Sutton Place and the Hamptons and the lofts and workshops of the Garment District. It's about financiers and offices almost floating in the clouds above Wall Street and the descendants of black free men and Puerto Rican cane cutters in the leather trades. It's about the Hudson Highlands, a destroyer moving through smooth swells in the Bay of Biscay, the 82nd Airborne shot to pieces by our own guns, 
during the invasion of Sicily. It's about the ineffable quality, power, and charm of a woman's voice. It's about a soldier's infatuation at a Kensington dinner party with a woman he will kiss on the street and never see again. It's about those lost in battle, the continuing devotion of soldiers who were with them, and the love of the widows and parents who were not. It's about love unrequited, love burnished to a dull shine by decades of marriage, and young love inimitably fresh and potentially everlasting. It's about parachuting into and fighting through France with the Normandy invasion, about snow, death, and visions upon the Siegfried Line. It's about sailing in the Atlantic off Mount Desert Island, San Francisco in the sun-saturated Sacramento Valley after the war, the steel mills of Gary, Indiana. It's about the daring of a returning soldier who refuses to be intimidated by the mafia and chooses instead to fight, the wrenching memories of a nurse in the South Pacific, the beauties of color and song, the price of honor, a marriage made in heaven, and the extraordinary courage and perseverance of a young actress. It's about the seasons, the blooming of the trees in spring, storms at sea, and the golden light that settles upon the harbor when the sun shines beneath a low ceiling of dark cloud. It's about the wonderful bustle of restaurants, and this is not my line, it's, flat, it's um, uh, not Flannery O'Connor, um, Carson McCullers, I love the line, the wash of sound coming from the bar. Uh, it's about the, even clothing uh, and how it's linked to emotion when it becomes a part of the people we love. It's about sex in its purest, strongest, semi-hallucinatory, transcendent manifestation. Stations, it's about love, loyalty, constancy, beauty, and justice. And then it's just a love story about Harry and most of all Catherine, whose radiance as a child, a girl, and a woman never dimmed. And all of this and more springs from the sight of a beautiful young woman dressed in white on the Staten Island Ferry at the beginning of summer 1946. Those are some of the things that it's about. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. It's a book with classical themes. It's a book about honor, love, and courage. Why did you write it? To make money. <laughs> uh, I mean, actually, that's a, you know, Dostoevsky, when asked, Dostoevsky said, anyone who writes for anything but money is a blockhead. He, he, he said that. And there is something to that, which is that if you set out to do something great and earth-shaking and to, you know, if, if you're a, you have a poetic sensibility and you want to and you, and, and you want to do something great, you, you're likely to trip yourself up and, and really get screwed because uh, that you, it's self-consciousness. But if you have a guiding principle, which is, in, in my case, to make a living uh, and to do something that you love, then, and, you, and you just do it you know, like, a, like a, a bicycle chain moving in a steady rhythm, uh, day in and day out, and you become a professional, then then your, your baser motives serve to keep you tied down to somewhat anyway to the earth and, and, you, and you can then do something which is, if you're lucky, uh, beyond your own capacities. I heard Liz mentioning as we were backstage uh, this quote, and I believe you have a letter um, from Norman MacLean yep. uh, where it was Norman MacLean who was talking about uh, writing A River Runs Through It. Mm -hmm. And there's a common theme here between the reason he wrote his book and the reason that I attribute you writing your book. You've said it. Yeah, I, you know, there's a, uh, there's a book out, um, and if you read military publications, you might be familiar with it. It's called One Last Look. Uh, it was written by the, uh, or perhaps for the veterans of the, the Army Air Forces in World War II who, who wanted to take one, because they're dying out, obviously, one last look at what they, the, what they did during the war and some photographs of, uh, of B-29s and, and other such things. And I thought of this as, as one last look. Uh, before I die, uh, a, a look back at my, my parents' generation and my very young childhood, uh, so as to preserve it, at least for myself, as I, as I, as I wrote. You know, to go back in, in, in memory. Uh, I, if Nabokov uh, hadn't titled the book Speak Memory, I would have titled this book that. Um, it's too, you, you can do that. You, can, you can't copyright a title, and it's, it's a homage to, to make a title, but it's too close in time. You know, it's one thing to say Winter's Tale, 
but Nabokov was too, too, uh, too recent to, to do that. And I even met him once, by the way. Really? Want to, want to hear that story? Yeah, tell us. Uh, I was, uh, I was in, uh, uh, it's, when I was 17, I went throughout Europe uh, sort of with a knapsack and, and you know, hitchhiking and doing other such things. And uh, when I got to Marseille, I wanted to visit a girl in my high school who was an exchange student in Aix-en-Provence, and I wanted to impress her. She did become my girlfriend later on, but uh, I, I rented a motorcycle, and I, I had never been on a motorcycle. And I drove up to Aix-en-Provence successfully on this motorcycle. I thought it would impress her. This was the era of Steve McQueen, see? And, and I did not impress her because she was in love with a French boy who was 18, who was a, being a year older than me was like 30 years older, you know, and, and he was French. Uh, so on my way back, quite depressed, uh, the wheel of the motorcycle went like that, and I went head over heels, and the motorcycle landed upon me. I slid along the ground and got very badly injured. I woke up in being stitched in the sick bay of the destroyer Robert S. Owen, which was a, a Six Fleet destroyer, because they thought I was an American sailor who had been knifed or beaten up or something, uh, and they they I, I, I they was deposited in the ship, and then they discovered that I wasn't in the Navy. But I'm for, forever grateful to the Navy for that. <laughs> but anyway, I then went to uh, Switzerland to recover because in so many Russian novels, that's what you do, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and German novels too. Uh, Magic Mountain, this is why I did it. So I, I, the only way to get better, and I was really quite sick. I was covered with scabs all over the, it was horrible, and, and, and feverish. And, and I, I did go to Switzerland, and uh, when I travel, I, my wife can't stand it. Neither, I, my children hate me for it. I can't stop. I, you know, we, they say, oh, there's a, a motel and a restaurant. No, we've got to go to the next one, the next exit, the next exit. And sometimes we run out of gas. But anyway, I got to, to Lausanne, and I, mean, I got to Geneva, and I didn't want to stop because I just I was not comfortable stopping. So I got on the boat, and I got to Lausanne. By that time, it was dark, and it started to rain. It was an alpine rain. And I got soaked. I was really freezing. And every single uh, pension or, or hotel room was taken up. And I, 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 was, I was trembling and feverish and really sick. And I got on the, on the, on the train, I think, and I was the next stop was Montreux. Mm -hmm. And I was walking through Montreux in the dark and thinking to myself, if I don't find some place, I'm going to die because I was so sick, you know, I was trembling and sick, like a homeless person in the winter. I mean, that's, that's what happens. They die. So I saw this big hotel, and it said Montreux Palace. And I said, I, I, no matter what it costs, I've got to go there. So I walked in. I looked like a rat, you know, a wet rat. And I was with a knapsack, a kid who was his hair dripping, feverish, pale, full of scabs, I walk up to the desk and they say, what's, what, what's the, the charge? And they told me it was the rest of my budget for the summer. But I had no choice. I gave it to them. And they, sent, they put me in a room where the, the, the bathroom was about 1,000 square feet. And the, the bed had a, a quilt on it this thick. Anyway, I slept very well. And being 17 years old, when I got up in the morning, I was perfectly fine. I went outside. <laughs> There was a big balcony, about at least 50 feet long. Mm -hmm. And there was another uh, balcony with a little division. And sitting on the other side of the balcony was a, were a man and a woman having breakfast. And, and I think that the man was reading the paper. I don't remember. Or the man was writing, on, writing something on index cards. And the woman was reading the paper. Well, anyway, there was orange juice there. That I remember. And uh, so I walked over, and I said, uh, hello. Now, I've got to preface this by saying that my father had read all of Nabokov. Mm -hmm. And I also have to preface it by saying that it's pronounced Nabokov, not Nabokov. But I didn't know that then. And so I walk up to them and I, I say, I introduce myself. And they were horrified just looking at me uh, <laughs> because of my scabs and, and otherwise. And uh, then I, and they introduced themselves, and she did, and it was Vla Vladimir Nabokov. And I was so excited because he was, he was a great writer, and he was in the room next to me. And when I found out this, I said, I said, 
I looked at him. Now, he hated it when people called him Nabokov, as you might imagine. I looked at him and I said, Nabokov, Nabokov. And he, he winced. And I said, isn't that amazing? Because I'm a writer, too. <laughs> so that's, that's my Nabokov story. Or will be. <laughs> yeah, or, or will. No, I thought I was. Yeah. I still do. You know. yeah. So you, this is a good segue. You've lived just a magical life. I mean, you have done, uh, you have done so many different kinds of things. You've, um, uh, you've gotten a, a first-rate education. You've had a, a what, what do you mean? I went to Harvard. Well, that, that's not, you, oh, no, no, no. You went to grad school at Princeton. Well, I, I went to Harvard, Harvard Graduate School, Princeton, Columbia, Stanford, and Oxford. Uh, and because of that, I know that the uh, reputation of elite educational institutions is wildly overblown, and I'm living proof. Uh, so. Sorry about your kids that are going to those schools. There, it's much better now. Uh, so in, in Harvard, yeah. among the people in your, where did you, where did you live, and who were some of the other people in your dorm? In Harvard? Yeah. I, I don't remember them. No, actually, in my class, there was uh, Al Gore and Tommy Lee Jones mm -hmm. who were in my class. And uh, in freshman year, uh, Al Gore, at the very beginning of freshman year, we had, uh, there was a, the equivalent of the president of the student class, but it was called the representative to the undergraduate council. And you had to campaign for it. And Al Gore came to uh, the room where, that I shared with my freshman roommate, and it must have been the first two or three days. And he, he, he knocked on the door and he came in and he said something like, uh, uh, I, will, I will put more Coke machines in the union. And I will, and I will, and he was so sincere and so driven that we, we stood there, we sat there, sat there listening to him as he, as he harangued us about this thing. And we thought, and you know, nobody cared about the undergraduate council. And, and when he left, he said, so please vote for me. And, uh, and I will be your best representative that you can imagine. Uh, he talked then the way he talks now. <laughs> I've met him. That's spot on. Yeah. And when he left, oh, wait till you see my Howard Cosell. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And when he left, we looked at each other. This is really true. It's all true. He, he, we looked at each other, and we went like this. <laughs> and I thought, you know, what, what kind of idiot is this? He won't get elected to the, the undergraduate council. He has no future in politics. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have traveled by, uh, you, you were in the British Merchant Marine. That's not what it's British called. British Merchant Navy. The British Merchant yeah. Navy. Let me just interrupt you there for one second. Yeah. yeah. I went on too long already. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that you don't know, that virtually nobody knows, uh, I'll just tell this as, as, a, as a secret. It's no longer a secret, because I don't think I've ever told this I haven't written it anywhere. In 1967, I was in the British Merchant Navy. And again, from the testimony of my shipmates, uh, I have no other proof of this, but they were all very knowledgeable about this, and it was an unknown thing. In 66 or 67, you know, close to that time, uh, the British Merchant Navy is, is an arm of the Royal Navy. It carries auxiliary supplies and other such things. We have similar arrangements here. And uh, they're, they're in British Merchant Navy ships, some of them carried nuclear weapons. On one of those ships that was carrying nuclear weapons, there was a mutiny. And nobody knows about this. It was covered up for obvious reasons. But can you imagine a, a, a mutiny aboard a British Merchant Navy ship that was carrying nuclear weapons? Uh, I just wanted to say that because I have never said that in public, and it, it is true. Yeah. That should be the plot of Skyfall. That, that is really the plot of um, Crimson Tide, another movie with Denzel Washington. <laughs> so you, uh, you, wrote this, you wrote this book about New York in this, in this era. Talk about this era that, that, that this book is set. I want to I wanna contrapose that era with what's going on now. But, but tell us about post-war, World War II, the, the time period. It's really a character in this book. Okay, uh, that's a good, uh, very good observation that it is a character in the book, um, or equivalent to a character. It has a very uh, important function. Uh, the, uh, people ask me on this, this uh, tour that I'm doing, well, how do you know about that? You were born in 1947. 
And my answer always is this. Uh, first of all, when I was young, I, had a, I was like a, a sponge. Uh, and I, I had a visual, uh, I, visual, emotional, sensory uh, input memory that was really quite extraordinary. My father had a photographic memory. Because of that, he was, he was trained during the war. I was going to say, he was in the OSS, right? Yeah. Well, he worked for Donovan. I don't know if he's uh, technically in the OSS. But William Donovan, who founded the OSS, was his lawyer in the 30s. And, and my father was doing all kinds of stuff that was extra constitutional with uh, the, the, the connection between Roosevelt and Churchill. He was a courier. But, but anyway, in the war, he worked directly for Donovan, and he did extraordinary things. And one of the things he was trained to do was to be deliberately captured in, in Germany. Uh, he was in on the planning for the assassination of Heydrich. The Poles beat us and the British to it, but my father was in on planning that thing. And one of the things that he was trained to do was to be dropped and deliberately captured by the Germans and to be interrogated. He would, be, he would have been interrogated like crazy. And with his photographic memory, he was supposed to remember every, every you know, the plans of whatever building he was in, read, speed read upside down and backwards in German and commit to memory every document on every desk, everything on every bulletin board, then escape and disgorge it. Uh, back. Now, he never got to do that, but the reason that they picked him was because he had a photographic memory. He had a complete photographic memory. He could, people would play a parlor game with him. They'd say, when was the last time you were on uh, 23rd Street between uh, 9th and 10th? And he would say, you know, December 30th, 1937. And they would say, describe it. And he could describe every crack in the sidewalk, the names, if he had seen them, on the, on the directories of the brownstones, the things in store windows, and, you know, what the prices were, et cetera. He had a complete photographic memory. I inherited that when I was young, and it has since drained out like a water in a bathtub. Uh, but anyway, when I was little, I, I took in, and I still remember everything. Uh, in addition, the, the, the 40s were elongated into the 50s. Why? Because, for one, uh, there was no building in America until about the, the, the middle, you know, 54, 55, this, the, in, the cities looked the same because nobody built anything. This, when the soldiers came home, they built Quonset huts for them to live in. There was a housing shortage. And then they built the Levittowns in the suburbs, but no one touched the, the, the center of the city so that Manhattan, where I lived, looked the same as it had looked in the 30s because there was no building during the war and not much during the Depression. Uh, so in addition, the, to switch over from war production to civilian production took a while, and there, there was not this constant rotation and avalanche of new products the way we have now and the way that, that was, became uh, normal in the 50s. So that it was like, it was as if the, and also politically, uh, through 1952, it was the, the Roosevelt era, even though Harry Truman was different, he was, after all, a continuation of Roosevelt. I was born in Roosevelt's last term, and, and, uh, and until 52, it was still, the, the, in a sense, the New Deal. Uh, so that, that even into the 50s, when I was a little bit older, I, I, I had a, a good a grasp of that, of that period. That's, that's how I know about it. And what was the question? I forget. It was a good answer, though. Yeah. Now, you, you, write, you write autobiographically sometimes. This, this book is a little bit autobiographical. Your, your first book may have been autobiographical, but I think you would have disagreed earlier. Yeah. Well, every novelist, usually novelists write, I don't know about these days because I really don't know what's going on these days anywhere, uh, but most novelists write their first novel as an autobiography and they don't know it. I didn't know it. Uh, and I mean, I mean my, uh, Refiner's Fire, which is my first novel, is intensely autobiographical. And people would say, this is autobiographical. And I would say, no, it's not. You're crazy. Uh, I was crazy. I mean, everyone is when they write the first. You just don't know. You're blind to it. It's like Macbeth. Is this a dagger I see before me? Only the dagger is before you, but you don't see it. <laughs> and and uh, this novel, I, I'm old enough now, and having written my first novel and, and gotten over that delusion, is about 80% uh, autobiographical. When I say autobiographical, I also mean my father and my mother, and, and that, those people. Have, have, has and anyone I, had a chance to, to read this book yet, people? Yeah, yeah it's, it's good. So the, the uh, which is a relief to me. 
And to me too. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, after, that's that's after, 800 pages of yeah. a long time yeah. taking, it's hard to write a book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a relief to me uh, that you say that given some of the reviews I've received. It, it is about the monstrous women who, if they were reincarnated as tarantulas, would, could skip death. You know, I, so I, I will, you, you're going to take this one right over the fence. So yeah. you have written a book where you have characters who are good or who are not good, and you have written uh, a novel that it has encompassed everything that you talked about here. You, you actually have the audacity to try to, you know, create a world, recreate a world that has scope and multiple plots and touches on many very deep subjects. I named three, you named more. And, uh, and one, who let you do that? One doesn't do that in modern fiction. My wife. Well, <laughs> no, who let me do it? Um, you know, it's, it's, that's an interesting point because I'm not allowed to do that. One is not allowed to do that. You pay for it. Uh, I've been attacked like crazy because after all, in this book, if you can believe it, it's about um, rich, white, Episcopalian, patriotic, happy Republicans. And it's sympathetic. And it's sympathetic. Can you imagine that? And, and heterosexual, too. I mean, these are people who, I mean, they shouldn't be written about. It's not something that one writes about. But, you know, the, the, the way that I look at it is that uh, people's humanity trumps any kind of misconception or prejudice about them. Uh, one of the, the uh, I, I don't mean to be defensive about reviews, but they do sting. Uh, one of the, the, the uh, really vicious reviews that I got was, in, of all papers, USA Today, in which I was attacked for writing a book about the 1%, you see. And my, I, I, I wish that that guy were here, because I would, would say to him, uh, you know, the same impulse that makes you hate people who are you know, in, a, in, a, in a class, you, you think, that they're in, in this class that you had. And so you hate them, and, and you have a license to hate them. It's exactly the same as the impulse if they were on the bottom. You know, if, they were, if you hate rich people, you hate poor people too. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dehumanizing thing. Uh, also, by the way, that guy uh, said, said uh, he said one of the, the uh, and he, he really was very, very, very nasty, and he said, there's a disgusting dialect about a scene in which, in dialect, where poor people are mocked. Now, that scene took place in, the New York Diner. in, in Shrafts. Mm -hmm. um, this guy is, a, he's, you know, he, he could be, a, uh, I could be his grandfather probably, but uh, poor people didn't eat in Shrafts, number one. Number two, my, uh, my mother's family spoke like that. You know, one of the one of the women who's talking to the other says, "There was a war. There was a war." See, my, that's how my mother's family spoke. I don't think it was disgusting. Uh, and three, they were secretaries. They had good jobs. They were not not at all poor. So I mean, there was a lack of understanding. That. I I don't want to be defensive. Go ahead. Have it. You know, it, it brings us back. It brings us back to your mother, and I and I wanted to do that. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot. I think your mother uh, was in theater. She yeah. was in musical yeah. theater. Uh, so is the main character in this book, and that might bring us back to autobiographical, which may have been where we launched this side voyage. Right. Uh, uh, my, my mother, I, I wanted to make this book the way that Norman McLean, you mentioned Norman mm -hmm. McLean, and I, I, didn't, I didn't follow through on that. Norman McLean, uh, I have a letter which my friend Tom uh, sent to me. It was from Norman McLean. I, I take it was a copy. Uh, in which Norman McLean was re replying to a producer who wanted to buy the movie rights to A River Runs Through It. A River Runs Through It is a beautiful book. It has one of the greatest lines, I think, in American or English or all literature, which is the last line, as he says, I am haunted by waters. You know, it's just absolutely magnificent, especially since the, the whole book leads up to it, and it's like, a, like a, an atom bomb. It's so, so beautiful. Well, anyway, Norman McLean... Um, receive this letter, what happens when you write a book is that people in Hollywood who have uh, businesses called monumental studios, but they're actually in a basement apartment someplace, and they can buy stationery. Uh, they will write to you and say, we loved your book, and you know, we think it's magnificent. They, they lather it on, and they say, and we'd like to buy the, uh, the rights 
for a $500 option against a $5,000 purchase price for the movies, see? And then if you're like Ken Kesey, who sold the rights to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest for $14,000, and the picture then made hundreds of millions, then you sell it to them, and they take it, and they flip it, and they, if, if there's a, a, a demand for it, they sell it to a studio for many, many times that, and you're out, you're, you're done. So Norman McLean got a letter like that from somebody, and he, and he unfortunately took, well, fortunately, actually, took it seriously, and he wrote back, and in the letter, Writing back, he said, I waited until I was more than 70 years old to write this because I wanted to achieve just the right tone. And he said, because this, this book is a love song to my family. And, and then he explained to the guy that he's not going to sell it to him to make a picture. And I think it was only sold to Robert Redford after Norman McLean died. Uh, but, but anyway, this, was a, this book I did in the, in the same way. I wasn't quite as old as Norman McLean. Uh, and, and I probably haven't, and I know that I haven't uh, achieved the, uh, what he did, but it was my intent. And, um, but I had a problem, which was that Catherine in it, originally, you know, I, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's my mother and my father, because Harry's very close to my father. That's, that's true. But I couldn't do that with Catherine because you, I had to fall in love with her, and you can't fall in love with your mother. You know, unless you're Greek. Uh, so, I mean ancient Greek. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to insult many <laughs> Greek people. Uh, so, so I, what, was I, what was I, I had to find another model. Now, she is close to my mother, and my mother was in the theater. Um, my mother was hardly an heiress. She was so poor that she was, uh, when she, she had a, her, her father was a blind, a clarinetist who couldn't join the union because he didn't have enough money to, to pay the union dues. So uh, he had eight children, and they were literally starving during the Depression. And my mother, at a very young age, when she was in grammar school, was uh, given over to a, uh, a Shakespeare company in, uh, in New York run by an Englishman. And she became a Shakespearean actress. The first language was Yiddish, but then she was taught the Queen's English at the King's English at that time. And uh, she also was uh, sexually molested from a very early age. So it, it had made quite an impression on her, as you can imagine. But my, she was not an heiress. However, she did have many names like Catherine uh, Thomas Hale. And there are some similarities, but it had to stop there. So where, was, where did I get the, the model? If you've seen Citizen Kane, you probably remember the wonderful scene in which uh, the lawyer Bernstein, played by Everett Sloan, says, uh, and speaks about a woman that he saw on the Staten Island Ferry. She was dressed in white. And it was the great regret of his life, because he was an old man when he was saying this. He fell in love with her, you know, instantly from a distance, like Dante and Beatrice at the bridge. But he didn't speak to her. He didn't, he did, he, 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 and, and he's thought of her for the rest of his life. Now, that made a great impression on me, not only because it's one of the most beautiful scenes in cinema, a great scene, you know, like, like great literature, I think. And by the way, Tom Cruise in a movie paid homage to that, only the woman was on the subway. It was a clear allusion to it. But in addition, it made an impression on me because Everett Sloan, who, who was Bernstein in the movie, was a very good friend of my family, and I knew him very well from the time I was, I was, I was young. In fact, I used to see my mother, and I, I saw once, my mother and Everett on television, in a primitive Philco television, this, with a screen this big, um, when I was three years old, and my nanny put me in front of it to see my mother on this program, but she didn't explain to me that it was fiction. I didn't know what fiction was anyway. And I saw my mother and Everett Sloan, who was a friend of our family, plotting to kill her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I thought it was real. And that, that probably ruined me, but... Anyway, so, so that was one, you know, all these things came together that I will now list, uh, I hope briefly, um, like the spherical detonator of a nuclear weapon. You know, what happens is when you put uh, the, the fissionable material inside a sphere that then is timed with micro-timing devices to explode inwards all at the same time, it compresses the fissionable material 
and then that makes an, a, a chain reaction and a nuclear explosion. So all these things, I don't know which came first or whatever, they all came at once. The, the other thing was that, so there was the girl, in the, there was my mother sort of, but I had to abandon that, then the girl on the ferry. And then when I was uh, 14, 15, 16, I don't remember, my family had a house in East Hampton, and that's out on the tip of Long Island at the beach, it's in this book. And that's, that was a place where there are a lot of artists and writers, and of course, if there are artists and writers, there are also psychiatrists. So this is a great scene. Yeah. And they, they um, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock was there, Steinbeck. I remember seeing Steinbeck playing poker. Uh, and I, I didn't see Jackson Pollock, but I, but I saw a lot of people like that, movie stars and, and theater people of all stripes. So... Uh, they, were, they would have a lot of social gatherings, and I was always frightened of any kind of social... I've never been to a party. Uh, I've never had a cup of coffee. I've never paid for a taxi. I mean, a lot of things like that. But uh, I, I couldn't stand going to a party. I would sort of stand outside. And there was, there was once a party that my parents went to, and I was there for some reason, but uh, only on the edge, because I couldn't go inside. And there was a woman who was, at that time, the belle of Broadway. And she, she was singing, as they, they would do. You know, these actors uh, perform for each other in, in, in social gatherings. And she had the most beautiful voice I'd ever heard in my life. Uh, still, the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. She could sing, she'd sing one syllable, you'd hear 20 things in it. And I fell so in love with her. Of course, she couldn't even see me. I was outside, and she was in her late 20s. The Belle of Broadway, I was a kid standing in the, in the shadows. She didn't even know I existed. But I knew she existed. I never forgot her. She's the model for it. Uh, another model is that when I was a, uh, a later teenager, I was walking on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and I saw the most beautiful woman, beautifully dressed uh, in magnificent, uh, subtly and, and, and not ostentatiously, but just like, a, like royalty, walking down the street in an empty block on the Upper East Side, and she was weeping. And I thought to myself, well, you know, why? I'll never forget that. And that's also a, a, a model for it. Um, and these things just, uh, I mean, there, there are many, many different um, uh, inputs that then create the, the character. And then what you want, of course, is for the character then to come alive so that you follow rather than, than push. So you're following the string rather than pushing it. And if the character does come alive, uh, at least for, the, for, for me, that makes me happy. I hope that it becomes, the character comes alive for the reader, but of course, I can't tell. Do you normally outline your books as you write, or, or, no. or uh, you, no. you, you begin at the beginning and work your way through like the rest of us did? Well, I used to, I, I normally would think of the last line and then write to it. And what I would say is it's like, if you stand at the edge of a lake and you throw a, a silver dollar in the lake, and then you swim to it and grab it. Uh, so you, you know what the last thing is, so you can, you can get to it. And as you're going to it, you know it gives you direction. You see? But uh, I didn't do that with this one. Uh, I, I, just, I just sort of felt myself immersed in it. Um, I, I did it with Winter's Tale. I, I did that. I had the, the last scene in mind. But not, not with this one. Uh, we have time for some questions. We have some microphones up here. You want to take some questions? Oh, I love, love questions. You, you were asking. <clears throat> I, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> Your turn. Uh, at, at, the, at the microphones at the front, please, uh, please come up. And, and while people make their way up, uh, let me ask you to elaborate on just the one point. Please come up. Um, how can you have never paid for a taxi? Uh, Did you hear that? Yeah. You slipped it in there, but yeah. That, I, uh, I, I've ridden in taxis, but only when other people, like publishers, pay for them. Uh, because w when, I was, when I was young and I lived in Manhattan, I wouldn't even pay for a subway. Sometimes I rode the subway, but rarely. I would rather walk. So I used to walk some 20 miles a day just to get from place to place. And today I walk 10 miles. Uh, I walked up here from my hotel downtown just to scout it out to make sure that no one was going to ambush me. <laughs> I, I, just, I did a reconnaissance and I walked back and I walked all around. I walked for hours and hours. I like to walk, and I don't mind bad weather. Uh, I, I kind of like it. And by the way, when you, when you walk in the rain, 
Uh, there's no point in doing like this, see, with your head down like that. It doesn't make you any drier. I see people on the street, and they're walking in a cold rain or something, and, they, and they're doing it like that. Don't do that. Put your head up. You know, look right into it. It, it, it doesn't make, it's not worse, and it makes you feel more dignified. This is, <laughs> this is instructive. Yeah. Let's, let's go over here. How are you? That was beautiful. <laughs> Everything's beautiful that you say. Thank you. Could you move a, a little away from the microphone, because I couldn't actually sure. hear. Yep. Um, what is your rewriting process or revision? Very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, the, when I was young, I hated to rewrite. I really hated it. It was a labor. It was a chore. I loved to write. It was, it was magnificent. It was a wonderful thing. Uh, if I didn't do it, I would die. Probably literally. It's like therapy. You know, it's, it's something that I need to do. If I don't do it, I'd be in real trouble. But I didn't like to edit and rewrite. It was a terrible pain. As I've gotten older, uh, I find that I enjoy the editing and rewriting as much as or even more than the actual writing, which is really strange. Because what it means is that the critical facil facility is growing and the creative facility is becoming otios uh, or oshos. I don't know how to pronounce it. But uh, I do. But if I, when I sit down and write something, it's going to be 12 drafts later that it gets into a book. And those are, I write it in, in longhand, and then I do about, I go over that about three times. Uh, well, I say once in black ink, once in red, once in blue, and once in green. That's four. <laughs> so four times beyond the first, first writing. That's on, on, on a piece of paper, and I love the way it looks. It looks like the Rosetta Stone. You know, it's very, very complicated, and it takes a long time to type that up into the word processor. That then becomes draft number six, and then the word processor makes it easy, and, you, and, and this, again, Rosetta Stone on that, and then another draft, and the Rosetta, and then another, another, and then it goes to the copy editor. No, then it goes to the editor, the publisher. And these days, hardly anyone edits anymore. I mean, it's just, it's like Britain. In Britain, they stopped editing uh, many, many, you know, decades ago. Now in America, I guess for, for financial reasons, nobody edits. But, they, but they, in my case, it goes to the president of the company, and he says, well, he, he edited it. He did a very good job, actually. Um, and he sent me three or four pages of, of uh, suggestions and questions, et cetera. You deal with that. And then it goes to the copy editor, and that's all the little details. And then it goes to the proofreader, and then it goes to the blues. You get the blues. And then it's in a book, and there are still mistakes in the book. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's 12 drafts, more or less, and it's a great, great pleasure. Uh, I, I just love to do it now. What is your question? Good evening. I really enjoyed your book, Freddie and Frederica, mm -hmm. and I was wondering what it was that attracted you to that story. Uh, Freddie and Frederica is about um, the prince and princess of it's a, it's uh, fiction. It's a. Uh, it's a really. It's just for fun. Uh, although there's more to it than that. It's about the prince and princess of Wales who are, who screw up the way the real ones did, and they are uh, sent to to prove themselves to as punishment and also to to, to prove that they're worthy of uh, the throne, that he's worthy of the throne, uh, to America to regain the colonies for Britain, and they're parachuted uh, semi-naked from a plane over New Jersey. Uh, and then they, they go across America in a very uh, Tocquevillian sense, uh, and it, it develops from there. And it's, it's mainly, uh, I hope, funny. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea came to us, to me, when my, fam my wife and my two daughters, who were very little then, uh, were on tour for uh, Soldier of the Great War. In those days, when publishers weren't bankrupt and there weren't e-books, uh, I was on tour for that book for three months. Three months on the road. I did 70 different places. You know, being a writer is like being a traveling salesman. I know practically every city in the United States. In, 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 if I can just go a little bit, bit off track here. Uh, what they do is, they, they, for people who haven't done this for, for 40 years, they have escorts. They meet you at the airport and they drive you around and everything. And they're always divorced women who want to talk about their divorce. 
And if you have to sit in a place and talk all the time. This you is why you walk. This is why one reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't have, you don't want to sit in a car and talk to this woman about her divorce. Uh, but, but I don't have those escorts. Anyway, we, were, we did 70 different things and it took us three months. And I took my whole family with me because we didn't want to be apart for three months. And in some place in Oregon, I think, we were in a restaurant. And it was a kind of restaurant where you have a, a glass wall and you see everyone in the kitchen, including people washing the dishes. You know, it's very busy and it was a, a fad at the time. So my, my girls who were, you know, uh, this was 91, so they were uh, six and four, were watching the people wash the dishes. And that was the time when, when uh, Charles and Diana were much in the news. And one of my children pointed to the to a man and a woman who are washing dishes and said, is that the prince and princess of Wales? <laughs> and I said, no, but I figured that's a great idea. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> and that's, that's how it came about. That's fabulous. That's funny. Uh, we have time for one more question? No, we, can't we do more than that? Yeah. We have time for two more questions. Two more questions. <laughs> we, yeah. Uh, I had the same question about uh, a soldier of the Great War. Alessandro became, has become part of my alter ego, or part of my, my, my self, so I'm curious about what oh, was behind okay. that. Okay, that's, that's a, uh, that I can answer very simply. Uh, in that same year that I mentioned before, when I was 17 and going around Europe, I found myself in, uh, in a place called, uh, I think it's Nova Potente. It's, it was, East of Eboli, you know, Eboli, uh, the book Cristo e Fermato a Eboli, Christ Stopped at Eboli. Um, and I, I had hitchhiked with a, uh, with a, a midget uh, who was the chimney sweep in the Italian Navy. Really, <laughs> be, because they needed a small person to go up and down the chimneys of ships to, to so He picked me up and he didn't have windshield wipers and it was rainy. So he was a little, in a little Fiat, and I had to lean out and do like this <laughs> all the way to southern Italy. Uh, but anyway, I walked, I walked east because I wanted to get to Brindisi to go to Greece. And I found myself in the middle of the night at really about 3 or 4 in the morning at a railway station in, I think it was called Nova Potente. And there was a, a local train that was going to, to Brindisi, and I, I, I wanted to get there faster than walking all the way across, which actually I did subsequently. And uh, so I was waiting for this train in the, in the railway station, and the, the wait, in the waiting room there were these southern Italian, there were southern Italian pe peasants who, in, in the, you know, in, 19, in the 60s, Italy was completely different than the way it is now, just completely different. And there were you know, women in, in black and people with uh, chickens in a, in a cage. And we waited for uh, at least an hour for this train. Uh, and I was exhausted and tired. And standing across from me was a man in a white suit. And, a, and he had baffi, which means mustaches. White, he had white mustache and white hair and medals on his white jacket and one leg. He only had one leg and he had a, crutches, or I think one crutch. And he thought I was German. In Italy, they used to think I was German. The kids would throw rocks at me. But my, my wife, even when my wife and I lived in Italy when I was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome, uh, we were, she, it was such a problem. She suggested that I have a t-shirt made that said, uh, non sono tedesco, sono americano. You know, I'm not a German, I'm American. Uh, but because people in Italy think I'm German, maybe it's because my my act, they, they think I'm Italian, actually, when I speak, but, but they, they think I'm German. And he thought I was a German, and the Germans had taken his leg in the First War. Uh, so uh, he was looking at me with hatred. I knew that I wasn't a German, and even if I had been a German, I was too young to have been in the First World War, or even the Second. And so I didn't accept that. And I looked back at him. You know, the, the, the thing was that you know, I was in his country, I was a German, supposedly, and he was looking at me, and so I, what I had to do is you know, stop the staring. So I had a staring contest with him. It lasted for quite a while. And in that time, I felt somehow, uh, magically, probably just a delusion, 
but I felt that there was a kind of a Vulcan mind meld <laughs> between me and him. I felt a sympathy, and, and I, I felt as if I, I, I knew this guy, uh, and, and I wanted to, to write about him much later. It came to me, and that's how Alessandro Giuliani was born in my head. So, okay, one more? One more. Okay. This is a brief two-part question. Number one, might Barbara Cook have been the uh, Broadway belle you referred to? I beg your pardon, I didn't hear that. I said, it? was Barbara Cook the Broadway belle you referred to when you were no. outside listening? No, oh. and, and you know, if she were, I, I don't, know, don't know who it was, but if she were, I wouldn't tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but she wasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then James had uh, asked a question about the state of New York now, and I'm wondering if you ever in future are tempted to write about what the whole East Coast is going through. Would it be fiction or nonfiction? Uh, I, I wouldn't. You know, it's funny because uh, in Winter's Tale, which I began to write in 1976 when I was in Oxford, and uh, I, I had a, 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 a flat. I, w I was actually, this is very interesting. Can I just say this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you may know who Martin Gilbert is. Martin Gilbert uh, wrote the magisterial uh, biography of Winston Churchill. 10,000 pages, not including the companion volumes. So it, it's, it's a magnificent, it's the greatest biography in English other, other than the biography of Samuel Johnson by Boswell, I think. And um, uh, Martin Gilbert was a, a professor at Oxford. The day after September 11th, 2001, two gentlemen came to his office and they said, we'd like to speak to you. And he said, you know, come in. And they took out an envelope and they spread pictures on his desk. And the pictures were of his classes in the 70s. And they said, do you know who this is? And first of all, he was amazed that someone was taking pictures of him in the, in the 1970s teaching his classes. And they said, do you know who this is? And he said, no, who is it? And they said, this is Osama bin Laden. And he said, and they said, do you remember him? And he, he didn't. He had no recollection of him. What amazed me about that is that the day after September 11th, they knew that Osama bin Laden, had, was it, they had photographs. Who was taking these photographs? It's just extraordinary. But anyway, uh, I was in Oxford, and I, the, the, uh, the housing was taken up. And they put me in the annex, and I didn't like it. I was in Magdalen College, Oxford. And, um, they, I wanted to be in the new building, which was built in the 18th century, but they, they put me in the annex. And so I rented a flat at Lower Farm. I was in Lower Flat, Lower Farm, Lower Radley. It was a turkey farm. Uh, and behind me, I, I had, there was a decoration. It was a uh, Hunters in the Snow by Bruegel. And that put me in mind of writing uh, uh, Winner's Tale. I forgot why I'm answering this question. Yeah. It was New York. Would you? Oh yes. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 It was a good question. It was a good. It was a good question. I'm not doing justice to your question. Um, oh yes. 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 So I began that in 1976, and the end of it is at the turn of the century, the turn of the, the millennium. New York Harbor is is the scene of a d tremendous destruction with a huge pillar of smoke rising into the sky, white, white smoke. Uh, and that's, this is exactly what happened in 2001. I mean, it was right there, the harbor, and this, this great cloud of smoke from the, the, uh, the dust of the World Trade Center and the, and the fires, you know, they kept on going. Uh, it was really very, very strange. So uh, as far as, I, I think I've done New York destruction, uh, and I'm not gonna do it again, <laughs> but also, this, what's going on now, is, is, uh, will be over soon, uh, and it's not that big a deal, really, compared to what it could have been or what it, what it might be in the future. Uh, the, the main thing to think of, I think, is that um, I, I was around for the hurricanes in the 50s. Uh, we had a, our, the roof of where we were staying was blown off, and uh, we, we saw that the eastern end of Long Island was actually made an island as the sea swept over it. 
uh, we went to the top of, to the rise at Hither Hills and looked over and saw that we were on an island suddenly, and the ocean was between Amagansett and Hither Hills, was three or four miles, completely covered underwater. Now, if you go there, that part which I have seen as ocean mm -hmm. has about a thousand houses on it. You see, and every time my wife and I drive past there, I say. These people are absolutely out of their minds. I have seen this when it was totally under the Atlantic Ocean, and those houses would be swept away. In, in, in the past half century, we have built right close to the ocean, all over the place. Mm. So regardless of whether the sea levels are rising or storms are getting worse, and that's a whole other question, regardless of that, by building so close to the sea, and by not taking uh, steps to, to uh, and, th and this of course was subsidized by federal uh, flood insurance given to people who built uh, you know, luxury houses near, right near the ocean. Re regardless of the scientific question, one way or another, uh, we're in for it because yeah. those houses will be swept away. Yeah, when, one's tempting one's fate, right? Yeah. It's not proper preparation. Last, uh, to close, mm -hmm. this is the Humanities Festival. Uh, these feel like such turbulent times, and it has been such a pleasure to read your book this week and to, uh, to read again for pleasure and to uh, remember all of my classics. And I, I think that you, as, as I read your book, have, uh, have been a student of these as well. What do you think that uh, the humanities have, that the classics have to teach us in an era such as this? Oh, everything, you see. We have been uh, gradually over the last 200 years scientized. And what I mean by that is that uh, the classic forms of literature, would, would really in, in the, certainly in the novel and uh, in, in the theater, the, the classic form is the romance. It has nothing to do with romanticism. It has nothing to do with bodice rippers. It's, it's, the, it's the type of story which goes back uh, to the beginning of human history and has certain elements in common. It's very, very a deep subject. The great study was written by Henry Miller, not the Henry Miller of the Tropic of Cancer, or Tropic of Cancercorn, but Cancercorn, yeah, Capricorn. But uh, Henry Miller, who was a professor at, at Princeton, uh, who, who wrote a, a, uh, the various uh, studies about the, the romance as a form. And, and if you read them, you become convinced that in fact that is the basic uh, uh, structure of, of, of fiction since, since from, from the beginning of, of recorded history until about the middle of the 19th century when realism came, came into fashion. And this was because uh, of the power of science. Science is, deals with what you can prove, as it should. It's like one of those, those machines that lay down a track. You know, even in the 19th century, when we built the transcontinental railroads, the advantage was that supplies were brought up on the track that had already been laid. And now we have machines that, that actually, that it's like a, it's like a, you know, a big uh, automatic uh, coffee maker or something. It just proceeds along and, and it automatically lays down the track and it just goes along laying down the track. The bed has been prepared. But that's what science is like. It has to have a connection to the, to the logic of what precedes it and it has to be provable. But there's, most of life is not provable. You can't prove beauty. You can't even define it. Uh, Croce wrote a whole book called Aesthetic, which, which is an attempt, a big, thick book, an attempt to define beauty. It can't be done. We, we don't know, uh, the, no matter how far we progress, we'll never, because of our limited tools, you know, the, the reason is a limited tool, we'll never be able to know when, the, uh, when or why the universe began, where it's going, even if it never began and it's somehow circular, we can't understand, it's not possible for us to understand infinity one way or another or even circularity. The, the real questions that, that concern us emotionally and as, as human beings really can't be answered by science as much as science can help us in medicine and, and, and in in, in living and in, in, in power, powering uh, us over nature where it's required. Do you find comfort in the humanities? Yes, because they, the humanities deal with 
those questions that, that science is, is, has no business even asking. And, and how do they do it? And I'll close with this. How, how do they do it? Well, you may be aware of the experiment in which they've set people up in front of a, a screen. And they flashed an image on the screen. And they discovered that, that consciously, no one was able to remember anything, an image like an apple or a car or a candy cane that was less than one-fifth of a second. If the shutter went to one-fifth of a second or less, people couldn't, couldn't perceive it, apprehend it. Then they put them under hypnosis, and they flashed images on the screen, and they discovered that people could, could remember perfectly images that were flashed at one five-thousandth of a second. Your subconscious is so much smarter than your consciousness. That's what the humanities deal with. They deal with emotion, uh, for instance, when you walk, you don't think about putting one foot in front of the other. In science, you think about that. I mean, science is like thinking about putting one foot. It's very deliberative. But, but the things that, that, that are the purview of the humanities are not deliberative. They arise from someplace uh, wonderful within and in, in a fashion which is much more powerful than, than, than any we can do deliberately. And that's, that's something that has been slighted, I think, in life because we're so busy getting and spending and trying to control everything and trying to be reasonable about, about everything. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot more in the world. Mark Halpern. Thank you.